So today we are uh, carrying on with Kripke on uh, the causal theory of reference um, and uh, we'll um, look more at Kripke on Wednesday. Um, there won't be any lecture on Friday this week um, and no office hours this week and there won't be any lecture on Monday. I'm sorry about that but I'm needed elsewhere. Um, and. Uh, uh, if you want to get on with things in the meantime, then um, I mean, what's the basic thing you have to do? You do the reading. Um, and uh, if you want to read more, what I would recommend is um, you could either look, try and get hold of uh, Naming and Necessity. There's a book, Naming and Necessity, um, from which we're looking at some extracts here. Um, you might try and look at the whole book. Um, or else, and this would be my inclination if I was you, I just read ahead in the reader, read the Putnam and particularly Evans's article, The Causal Theory of Names, which is coming up next part one. That's a very long, rich article. Um, at this point, you should be able to read the Evans and make sense of it, though it will be slow reading. Um, and it's really a book, that article. There's much more in it than we'll manage to cover in the lecture. So if I was you and you want to get out and get on in the meantime, I'd look at the uh, Evans. Yep. yep. Sorry? Oh, by Kripke, Naming and Necessity. Yeah. So the, the, the Naming and Necessity in the reader is an extract from a longer book, also by Saul Kripke, if you see what I mean, called Naming and Necessity. I honestly don't know if you'll have it at the bookstore. You would certainly be able to pick it up from Amazon. Um, but it's a very it's, it's probably the single most influential book in analytical philosophy since the war. Um, so you know, there should be copies around. Uh, you, you see what I mean? I, I I haven't checked in the bookstore, but they'd be quite likely to have it. I should think. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so today I want to uh, look at, uh, as you all have seen, Kripke has an attack on the description theory of names. Um, last time we looked at one kind of attack he has, this thing about rigid designators and flexible designators. Um, he also has a more kind of straight down the line um, attack on description theories like the theories of Frege and Serle. I'll begin by looking at that. And then we move on to his positive picture. Um, as to how reference is fixed and uh, I'll wrap up by looking at what happens to Frege's puzzle about informative identities on Kripke's picture. Um, it turns out we'll see that um, the puzzle of informative identities is actually harder on Kripke's picture than it was on Frege's. Um, it doesn't go away, that puzzle about informative identities you just see more and more how difficult it really is. But let's start out with um, uh, the question about how the descriptions of proper names, how the references of proper names are fixed. I mean, that was a basic question in this class. How do signs get hooked up to the world? And all we've been doing so far is really isolating names as the basic contact point between language and the world. And uh, <coughs> Last time we were looking at how do names and descriptions refer in lots of different possible worlds. Um, and the argument was names keep their reference from world to world. Descriptions vary their reference from world to world. So to get that argument moving, you have to be looking at what's going on when you're talking about different uh, possibilities. but. The argument of Kripke that we're looking at today is about just about what goes on in the actual world. If you take a name like Gödel and look at who that name refers to in the actual world, how does that get sorted out? How does it come about if we just think about all the ordinary concrete objects that the name refers to this concrete object rather than any other? Well. Um, on a, a Frege-Serl kind of view, the way it works is 
Um, you have a cluster of descriptions associated with the name. Um, you might call it the dossier, the file, um, what you have on Girdle, and that's what fixes the reference of the name. There are all these descriptive characteristics of Girdle, like the person who um, discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic, the great mathematical Platonist, the refuter of logicism. Um, whatever your favorite description of Gödel is, put them all into the cluster, and whatever best fits that, that's who the name refers to. Um, so the cluster of descriptions associated with the sign, that's how the reference of the name gets fixed. And it's consistent with Searle's picture. I mean, Searle was quite explicit about this, that when you've got a bag of descriptions associated with a name, um, then some descriptions might get more weight than others. Um, there might be some indeterminacy as to just how many of those descriptions an object has to match to be the one you're referring to. And there might be some indeterminacy about what's in the bag in the first place. But still in all, often enough, that cluster of descriptions would single out a unique object. Kripke's argument is that's not the way it works. If you just look at uh, what goes on in our ordinary use of language, um, the descriptions we actually associate with the names don't, in fact, fix their references. So take it that Gödel has, a, suppose that what we've got is that uh, the, the key description associated with the name Gödel is the person who discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic. Um, well, it could turn out, could it not, that someone else um, actually discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic, and that Gödel is actually a somewhat shady character. What happened is some industrious undergraduate, some brilliant industrious undergraduate, you know the type, um, discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic. Gödel, a somewhat shady professor, um, on the lookout for academic celebrity, um, stole the credit, took the work, did something to shut the student up, um, and became famous as a person who discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic. In that case, um, we've got Gödel, and we've got his reference. The fixer is the description, the person who discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic. But what would you actually say happened in this case? Would you say, um, well, who matches this description? Is it the professor or is it the student? The student matches the description, but when we use the name Gödel, are we referring to the professor or the student? The professor. So the person we're referring to is not the person that matches the description associated with the name. And it's a very simple case. I mean, I'm sure you all have stories like that yourself, right? Uh, um, not in this class, but uh, 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 similar classes. And um, I mean, this is Kripke working through the example. Suppose that Gödel was not, in fact, the author of this theorem. A man named Schmidt, whose body was found in Vienna under mysterious circumstances many years ago, actually did the work in question. His friend Gödel somehow got hold of the manuscript and it was thereafter attributed to Gödel. That could happen, right? No contradiction in it. And then the name Gödel is not referring to the person who matches the description. So the cell theory is not right. I mean, Kripke says, look, think about um, what descriptions people actually associate uh, with uh, the names they use. I and mean, if you look at what most people think Einstein did, you might well find most people think Einstein was the inventor of the atomic bomb. 
Does the name Einstein therefore refer to the person who actually did invent the atomic bomb? No, it does not. Right? I mean, actually, um, I, I was once saying Cicero Tully. I, I don't know anything about Cicero and Tully except they're a couple of Greeks. Um, and someone said, no, <laughs> they're actually Romans. Um, uh, I mean, even that was wrong. I mean, many of the names we use, uh, we don't actually know very much about the people. Yeah? Stephen Hawking, famous chemist. Right? No? Epistemologist, right? <laughs> Cosmologist, okay. <laughs> um, I was still referring to Hawking when I said that, right? The descriptions were all wrong. Exactly, right. So the descriptions you associate with a name can be all wrong. You're still referring to that thing. Yeah? And what goes on in these kind of cases is that I don't think this is working. Oh, this is working. Right. Um, I, 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 what goes on in these cases is that there is someone really around who steals the credit, who does all this stuff, and um, it's because of them that we use the descriptions we do. But they don't actually match the description. If I tell you I've won a, no, a Nobel Prize um, and you're all suitably impressed by this, I mean, I do it suitably convincingly, right? Then you may say Campbell, the philosopher in the department who won that Nobel Prize, isn't that great, right? right? Um, now, just between us, by some strange anomaly, that has not yet happened. Um, uh, but in that case, I would be the one who made you think there was such a person. That would be right, yeah? But the description doesn't actually match me. You still be referring to me. Yeah. There's a, just one other example. Once you get the hang of this kind of example, you can generate them indefinitely yourself. Um, one other case. People sometimes say, Shakespeare didn't write any of those famous plays. Those famous plays were actually written by, by Francis Bacon. Um, now, Someone who says that is saying, um, when we mention Shakespeare, we're not talking about the man who actually wrote the plays. That was Bacon. We're really talking about the person who stole the credit for the plays. Um, but if Cyril was right, Shakespeare is whoever did actually write most of those plays. Um, and so if, if Shakespeare is just a name for whoever wrote most of those plays, then when I put forward the Bacon hypothesis, what I'm saying is really that Bacon is Shakespeare. But that's a weird way to put it, right? That, 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 that's not what you're saying. You say that Shakespeare didn't write the plays. You're saying that Bacon wrote the plays. You're not saying Bacon turns out to have been Shakespeare. That would be a different scenario. It's also possible that Bacon is Shakespeare, I agree. But that's a different scenario to the one where there were two people, right? Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so this is a very simple argument Kripke has, but it, I think it's very powerful. If you just think, in fact, what descriptions we do associate with the names we use, um, uh, it's obviously possible that the thing that matches those descriptions best is not the thing we're referring to when we use the name. Okay? Not plain enough? Is that convincing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's true, but I guess um, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, in, in some cases there might not be very much in the cluster anyhow, right? I, I think that's true of Gödel. I mean, insofar as people have heard of Gödel, usually pretty much all they know about them, unless they're specialists, is that this was the discoverer of that theorem. Yeah. 
Um, but couldn't you do that? I mean, take um, take the name Bill Clinton. Maybe none of what was thought about Bill Clinton was right. Yeah. He was never president. He never met Monica Lewinsky. Um, he was never elected president. I mean, and, uh, he never actually took the oath. Right? That was all dubbed and staged. Um, some actor took the oath. Right? So he was never actually correctly sworn in as president. He never actually became president by the rules. You have a description of what he looks like, but, you know, maybe that's all done by um, cosmetics and clever subject, clever tricks with mirrors and body doubles. Um, he doesn't really look like that. You see him at night, boy. It's a, <laughs> it's a very different story. He never actually met anyone called Monica. Um, you know, none of that was right. You can imagine all that. I mean, the story becomes a bit of a story. I'm not, uh, <laughs> just in case you've just suddenly woken up, I'm not telling you that this is actually how it happened, right? right? <laughs> this is just an example, right? But So the story gets a bit tortured uh, as you go on, yeah? But that's all that's happening. It's just getting a bit tortured. Um, it may seem a bit strange, but it makes about as, <laughs> it makes about as much sense as most of what I say. Um, if, if you see what I mean, it still makes perfect sense, yeah? Uh, and still we're talking about that man even if most of what is commonly believed about him is false. Oh, as you went on, you would be replacing it with other descriptions. That's right. But you didn't know those descriptions to begin with, but you were nonetheless referring to the person who best... Uh, uh, the, you were referring to the person those descriptions, those descriptions matched, even though you had no idea they were there. Is that convincing? You can have all these descriptions associated with it. If, if I say, you don't know me, none of you really know me, right? <laughs> that kind of remark makes perfect sense, right? It could really be true. You're all still managing to refer to me perfectly fine. Yeah? Uh, Well, you'd have to say we, we've got the cluster, and enough of the cluster is always right to single you out uniquely. But you don't know that. I mean, that's the whole thing about these examples. It would be tortured, it would take a while to m explain how this could happen, but I could tell you a story in which virtually everything you think about me is false. He's not really a professor. You know? That's easy. I could do that, you know. <laughs> right. Just take the first things, right, just work through. You can do that. You're still referring to me. Uh, one, two, yep. Oh, well, yep. Right, but remember that Searle's theory says is whoever best fits the descriptions in the cluster, that's who it refers to. same thing. That's very interesting. That's that's not actually how Searle puts the theory. Um, Searle says, how does the name get hooked up to the object? Well, by being associated with a cluster of descriptions, and it's whatever matches what's in the cluster of descriptions. That is Searle's theory. Now, you're giving a different theory. You're saying, it doesn't matter who best matches the cluster of descriptions. Yeah. Um, what, what The important thing is, whether your cluster of descriptions is the same as mine, 
then we know we're talking about the same thing. Um, but how the how the name gets hooked up to that object is not necessarily as whoever best matches the cluster of descriptions. That's your take. First of all, I promise you Settle would not do that wiggle. <laughs> That's not the, the, the approach. <laughs> but, um, but the thing is, the way you're putting it presupposes that the name has got hooked up to the object somehow, but not by way of the cluster of restrictions, as matching cluster of restrictions. Yeah. And you haven't said how that is, the name has got hooked up to the object. Now Settle did mean to be addressing that question. You're not actually addressing the question. You're doing something interesting, but it's something different. It's saying, suppose the name is hooked up to the object. How do I know that you, you and I are using it to refer to the same thing? Yeah, and that's a different question. Uh, I, I have no idea who's first. Um, you, you're right at the back. Yeah. Well, uh, how, do, how does it work? I mean, we have to be able to refer to things in the first place, right? Before we can say, no, we think those descriptions are true of it. But how did we do that? Right, that's right. So the use of the name is coming first, before we have any, before we consider what's going on with the descriptions. And then there are the descriptions you believe to be true of the thing you named. But how did the name get onto the tracks in the first place? I agree, what you're saying is very plausible, right? But it's just that there is a question now that you have to address, which is how did we get that name hooked up to the object in order that we could then form all these beliefs about what descriptions the name the named thing meets. That's one theory. You might you, you could call that the placard theory, right? Everybody holds up a placard saying my name is like um, a starter term mixer. <laughs> right? Everyone has a badge here. Yeah. That could that, that could be that'd be one theory, yeah. I mean, it's not actually right, okay? Because we we don't all wear badges, in fact, except in mixers. Um, but that's the kind of thing you have. To, that's not a description theory. That's a placard theory. It's a different theory. Yeah. If that's right, the server is wrong. Uh, okay, we've got to be quick. You, you, you'd want from a while ago. You? No? It's gone away. You had a question. Okay. okay. Uh, Okay. Right. Front. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. Okay. Right. Right. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, I'm not completely sure I followed all that, but um, if I did, then the point you're making is, suppose you've got the name Campbell and you've got this description, right? They can come apart, yeah? Um, the name, who, who the name picks out is one thing, and who the description best matches 
is an old thing. Yeah. Um, uh, that's Kripke's point. Yeah. That's a concise way of putting Kripke's point. Um, and then the next question is: So how does the name get hooked up to the object? If not by way of the description? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, uh, on that note, hold that thought and let's move on to looking at Kripke's own positive picture. Yeah. So I want to suggest, um, uh, just before looking at what Kripke actually says, an analogy. Suppose you consider the way photographs work. Here is a photograph of two simple geese. Are they geese? Or ducks? They're geese. OK, I was feeding them. I wasn't very sure if they were geese or ducks. Um, OK, so um, I put it to you that the, here, here we have two simple geese. Um, now, this photograph is a, l l let's consider the one in the front. Now, this photograph is a photograph of a particular goose, right? There's a, so there's a thing out here, um, the goose, and here we have it in the photograph. Now, which goose is this a photograph of? You can raise that question. It's kind of on an, an analogy with the question, how does a sign refer to a particular object? What makes the photograph a photograph of a particular goose? Yeah. Now, one answer is, actually, where I took this is out of the Civic Center in uh, San Rafael, uh, where we are uh, just beyond the camera here, um, about 5,000 further geese, all indistinguishable from this one, to, to my eye, anyway. And um, it really is 5,000. It's feeding the ducks California style. <laughs> it's just a gigantic formation. Now, if you look at this picture here, um, this individual goose might say, that is not a very good snapshot of me. It is not a good likeness. In fact, it doesn't look like me at all. It looks much more like my cousin Ermintrude over here. I mean, that, that happens with people the whole time, right? You get a photograph taken of you. You think, my god, that doesn't look like me. I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> but, <laughs> but maybe there is a person somewhere on the planet that that does look like, in which case they have my heartfelt sympathy. But it doesn't look like me, right? I can't be the only person that has that experience, right? Um, OK, so then you say, OK, well, it's a photograph. Um, uh, of this duck, all right. But that duck doesn't match the photograph. It's not a good likeness of that duck. So if someone takes a snapshot of you and it comes out looking nothing like you, it is still a photograph of you. But why is that? It's not because you're the person that best fits the photograph. There might be someone on the other side of the planet who really fits that photograph looks much more like that than you do. It's a photograph of you because you are the person from whom light bounced off, went through the lens of a camera, and hit the sensor pad or whatever it, <laughs> whatever goes on with a the camera these days. You, you know what I mean? That the, the, the CCD. Okay. <laughs> hit the CC, uh, hit the CCD. Um, <laughs> he said no, but you were there. <laughs> okay. um, that's what makes it a photograph of you. You're the person that was implicated in the production of the photograph, not that it fits you best. So what makes it a photograph, uh, a photograph of a particular uh, goose, is not that this is the goose that this looks most like. It's that. It's the goose light from which bounced in to the camera and generated this photograph. So there are two models there you can have of what makes a photograph 
a photograph of a particular object. One is um, the photograph's a photograph of whatever best matches the photo. The other is um, it's the person, it's the thing that caused the photo to be the way it is. That's uh, what the photo is a photo of. I think we don't want a match theory for photos. For photos, what matters is how the photo was produced, what the position was. Is that okay for photographs? Yep. Uh -huh. Can you say a bit more? No. <laughs> uh, it's harder for paintings um, because um, I might want to take, a, uh, I might want to make a painting of Elvis, right? Um, and in that case, if I have Elvis as my model, if Elvis is sitting there for me, right, then Elvis is the only one involved in the production of the painting. And even if it comes out not looking much like Elvis, it's still a painting of Elvis. It's just not a very good painting, even if it looks like someone else much more than it looks like Elvis. Yep. Well, <laughs> the, yeah, that's where it gets interesting. The thing about a photograph is there's no intention, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. I may be intending to take a photo of Elvis, but if I pointed at Goose, it's still not a photo of Elvis. You see what I mean? You might say that's a very bad photo of Elvis. It's, a, <laughs> it's not a photo of Elvis at all, right? But um, if I'm trying to do a painting of Elvis, uh, but I can't get Elvis for some reason. I cannot get him to sit for me. Um, then um, I might say, "Well, you'll do. You look pretty much like Elvis. You can be my model." And then you're involved in the production of the thing. But it's not a painting of you, because of my intention. I was trying to make it a painting of Elvis. So painting is more complicated. Right? That's one reason I take I take photos, right? Because of a photo, it doesn't matter what the person with the camera intended. Paintings. I think it's much subtler. What, what, what's going on? Yeah, but it's good to think about paintings as well as photos. It's good to think about photos too. But yeah. Okay. So, one way to think about um, names is um, just before we go on to Christie's thing is you could think of. I mean, what one thing Cyril is surely right about is that there is such a thing as the cluster of descriptions associated with a name. So you could think of the cluster of descriptions associated with the name as being like a kind of photograph of that thing. And then um, you similarly have the question, if you think of it like that, um, is what that's a photograph of, is what that cluster is a, 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 a photograph of, is that whatever best matches the cluster, or is it the thing that generated the cluster? And in the case of um, the Gödel or uh, uh, Bacon and Shakespeare kind of cases, there, it's the person that was involved in generating the cluster that's the important thing, not whether the cluster best matched them. So I think this is quite a good analogy. I put it to you. This is quite a good analogy for the way language works. Can you think about what that? So here's Kripke. Kripke says, suppose you're asking um, in, in practice, how does it work when a name refers to a person? Well, you have some kind of initial baptism. Um, there's the initial baptism of which you say, well, I dub this Schwarzenegger baby Arnold, right? I, say, I mean, something like that must have happened, right? The, 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 I guess it's not an equally right, but I, I, I take it for something like that. I don't, it's not a stage name. So you get this dubbing, and then people pass the name to each other. People talk, people gossip, people um, say, <laughs> have you seen the weights our two-year-old son can lift? Boy, watch him do press-ups. Um, uh, they say, that's Arnold, right? And so, <laughs> so the legend grows. Um, the name is passed from person to person. 
a, there is a kind of chain of communication um, radiating ever outwards, ever further and further. And something similar is true of you. There's some point at which people say, well, let's call this one Sally or Bill or Wilhelmina or whatever it might be. Um, and then people talk. The name, the, the, the chain of communication gets passed from speaker to speaker. Now, as this happens, clusters of descriptions relating to you will be generated. But it's not who is most best matching those descriptions that matters. It's, it's the fact that you're the one generating the whole thing. It's the fact that you're the source of the legend. It's the important thing. It's the two steps, the initial baptism and then the talk, the subsequent passing of the name from person to person. The Kirkby's general idea is what matters is how the cluster of descriptions is generated, not what best matches the cluster of descriptions. So we can break down the two steps here. The two steps here need, need separate discussion. Um, one part is that notion of the initial baptism. I mean, this needn't be religious, of course, but the idea is whatever it is, um, even if it's the moon or something, for which there was presumably no actual baptism in the conventional sense, somebody at some point said, let's call out the moon. Right? Do you see what I mean? I mean, almost like something like that. So there's that initial thing. Uh, which you name the thing by extension, by pointing to it, or you might fix it by description. You might say, let's call the silver round thing that comes up every night, let's call that the moon. Then the chain of communication where the name is getting passed from them to them. Now, how does this go? When do you have a chain of communication? Um, well, here's Kripke. Through various sorts of talk, the name of Feynman, the physicist, is spread from link to link as if by a chain. Uh, so you and I, hearing the name Feynman now, maybe never met him, um, weren't there at the initial dubbing, but there's a certain passage of communication um, reaching ultimately to the man himself from the speaker. The speaker is then referring to Feynman, even though he can't identify him uniquely. So I've got just some garbled stories I heard about Feynman, that's all. Might be true of him, might not. Doesn't matter. It's that the chain of communication goes back to that man. A chain of communication going back to Feynman himself has been established by virtue of his membership in a community which passed the name on from link to link. Not by a ceremony that the speaker makes in private in his study. I mean, when you, uh, if I ask you who's Feynman, you tell me a bit about Feynman. It's not that before I did that, I said to myself, well, by Feynman I shall mean is who I picked the name up from or where I got the name from that's the important thing. And you just rely on that in ordinary communication. If you're going to talk about Barack Obama, it is not because um, in the morning before um, coming into class, you said to yourself, well, today by the name Barack Obama, I shall mean, right? You just picked it up from the news circulating, and then you use it as part of a link in the chain. It's the actual chain that matters. That's Kripke's positive picture. It's very resonant, and we'll go into why it's resonant, but the basic picture is quite simple. Yep. Yep. That's all the answer you get from Kripke. Yeah. Uh, that's the whole thing you get from Kripke, right? But you're right. There is a further question. How does extension work? That is a real issue, right? Um, and it's not at all clear that by a description is a good answer here. If everything we've been saying from Russell is correct, then um, uh, reference can't ultimately begin with descriptions. So this actually puts a lot of pressure on what is going on when we talk about extension. Yeah? And it seems so clear, you say, um, here, here, here it is, 
let us call this um, Feynman is right there yeah uh, but we have to spell out what happened there okay, okay but yep the name has been changed oh yeah you mean people garble the name yeah Schwarzenegger it's not pronounced like that at all really you know, that's just how everybody pronounces it. That, that, that happens, right? People's names get mangled. Yeah. Um, I think Cookie's idea would be it's the chain. It doesn't really matter that the name's getting mangled a bit. Yeah. Uh, so long. I, I, I mean, Homer, right, going back to the Greeks, I mean, I doubt if they called him Homer, if you see what I mean. That, that, that wasn't what the name would have been. That, that wouldn't have been pronounced like that back then. Yeah. Uh, but still, that's who we're talking about. You just track through all the mangling of the name. Okay. There are complexities here. I mean, obviously, not every kind of causal chain is going to do. I mean, this is going to be very important, actually. Not every kind of causal chain that does reach back to something is going to do. I mean, suppose I. Um, Suppose I'm trying to think of a name for my dog, um, and I'm a great admirer of the governor of California, and I say, well, what should, it, what should it be? Shall I call it Big Arm, or shall I call it Schwarzenegger? And I say, okay, I'll go for Schwarzenegger, right? So from henceforth, I call my dog Schwarzenegger in tribute. Um, now, then there's a causal connection, all right, is because of the governor's achievements. So that, that's what I call my dog. But when I say, Schwarzenegger, Schwar where are you, Schwarzenegger? Right? I am not referring to the governor. Sorry, does that sound disrespectful? I don't mean it to be irreverent. Um, I guess I guess. <laughs> probably be fired. <laughs> but, um, I, it, it, the case we don't want is you hear a name and you try to use it to refer it to some unrelated object, right? That can easily happen. Um, and you say, well, that's not the right kind of causal connection. So what is the right kind of causal connection? And Kripke says, well, it's when the name is passed from link to link and the receiver of the name intends when they learn it to use it with the same reference as the person from whom they heard it. Yeah. So I heard the name Schwarzenegger, and so long as I mean to be using it to refer to the same person as you mean to be using it to, then I'm still functioning as a, as a link in the chain. Um, otherwise, I'm not functioning as a link in the chain. If I swap it out and say I'm going to talk about my dog using that name, then I just stepped out of the chain. So the key thing is my intention. This is one place intention comes in. Yeah. Okay. There are some problems about this. This is th these are very key passages in Kripke. They're quite brief, but they're very important. Um, I mean, someone told me the following tender and affecting story. Suppose that Spot is a family dog, loved by all the children who've played with it for years. And then the father of the household comes home one day alone and Spot is dead. I'm sorry, I should have warned you that this is a, a, a rather harrowing story. Um, but not wanting anyone else to be upset, he quickly and um, furtively disposes of Spot and goes to the um, animal rescue center, hunts about, and finds a dog that looks exactly like Spot. Now, he then goes back home, quickly um, inserts the new Spot there, um, and um, says to the family, look, Spot's acting kind of strange, but there you go. Um, and uh, they are taken in. Now, at first, when they all use Spot, they mean to be using it to refer to the same thing. When they use the name Spot in those first few weeks, 
Which dog are they referring to? The dead one, right? I mean, if they found out the truth, they would say, that's not Spot. That's an important... Where Spot? Come on, where Spot? <laughs> right? But suppose, suppose that this goes on for 10 years, 12 years. Suppose that the new dog has a long and happy life in the bosom of the family. Say about the 10 year, 12 year mark, which one are they referring to? New spot or old spot? If they say in the morning, um, spot's ill today, are they referring to the dead dog and saying something false? Or are they referring to the new dog and saying something true? Sorry? To the new dog, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's what would happen. Actually, that would happen quite quickly. Um, so they intended to refer to the same thing all along, but something happened. Some, the reference shifted somehow from um, old spot to new spot. So they were in a chain intending to refer to the same thing the whole way. There's something missing from Christian's story here. Something about the way a chain works to fix your reference to an object. There's a, it is a heartbreaking story, and I know it might be difficult to think about, but try to think about it a little bit, what, what, what goes on there. How would you identify why the reference shifted? Because of description? Because of intentions? Something else? Yeah. No, the, the definition, I don't know about the rest, but the, the, the end must be wrong. The, 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 the definition of definite description is not is perfectly good, I promise you. Okay, so we stick by that. Um, yeah, I, I just want to give one other example. Actually, actually I, just, I just want to kind of just drive on through because we're really close to the end. Um, let me give you another example. Um, suppose that um, I listened to two philosophers talking about, you know, Donald Rumsfeld's thing about. Um, the distinction between known knowns, uh, unknown knowns, um, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. That, that's right, isn't it? But, yeah. Right. So I listened to two philosophers discussing this, and they're discussing what it could mean and the exegesis of it. And I think they're talking about some pre-Socratic philosopher, um, you, you know, someone who lived maybe, um, uh, what, 3,000 years ago. And um, I'm saying, well, Rumsfeld, uh, um, did Rumsfeld influence Aristotle? Um, I mean, th th this is very interesting. This is obviously some fragment that was found, um, this thing about the known unknowns and so on. Um, when I talk about Rumsfeld there, um, and I say to people, um, uh, well, what do classical scholars nowadays think about Rumsfeld? Do they think he was influential? Am I, I, I mean to be, re I intend to be referring to the same person as the philosophers were referring to him, right? I mean to be doing just the regular thing like you might do with a name like Barack Obama. Just picking up the name and running with the ball. But when I do all that, am I referring to the present day, um, what was it, would you call him a politician? I guess he was a politician. Um, whatever he did, right? Administrator. Sorry? <laughs> right. Who am I referring to in that case? Am I referring to some piece of Catholic philosopher? Am I referring to a present day politician? And would it be right to say of me, he thinks this present-day politician was a pre-Socratic philosopher, just lived a long time. I mean, there's something, uh, the Kripke's thing is very simple. There's the initial dubbing, and then passing the name from person to person with the intention to keep referring to the same thing. But I think, <laughs> I think these examples show that there is something wrong. <laughs> Okay, it looks like that to you too, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I think okay. I just want finally to make a quick remark about what happens to informative identities in this kind of picture. Um, 
suppose we take photographs as our model for um, reference, right? We say, which I think is a fair way to put Kripke's picture, that the photograph is a good model for reference generally. So um, uh, I will, I'm going to show you a picture that is um, maybe a little bit harrowing, actually. Uh, if, you, if this was sharp, it would be very harrowing. But I, I, I take it at the moment this is a little, just a little bit harrowing, right? So here is a photograph. There is a photograph of a particular individual, right? Now, let me ask you the question: Is this the same person as this? You don't know. Would it be informative to be told that this is the same person as this? Yes, that would be an informative identity. Yep. Um, I mean, we're not talking about match here. We're talking about who generated the photograph is what makes it a photograph of that person, right? But even so, you can see that this is going to be an informative identity. Yep. Now consider this. Is this the same person as this? Is that an uninformative identity or an informative identity? Can you put your hand up if you think it's uninformative? Okay, and if you think it's informative, okay, um, and the you know, same reaction presumably for this one. See, I think if you have a match theory of the way photographs work, this is going to be uninformative because these two might are let's suppose pixel for pixel identical, right? Anything that matches one of them is going to match the other, yeah. Um, but suppose the question is. Who generated this photograph? Who generated that photograph? Um, you know, you can't tell if that's the same or different. After all, it could happen that I and my twin brother both get photos taken of us, and those photos are pixel for pixel identical. They'd still be photos of different people. These might be two twins. Maybe they had to take millions of shots to get them in just the same moment of high anxiety or despair. <laughs> but, but that's what happened. And these two different children generated pixel for pixel identical pictures. I mean, it's easier to see what ha that happening with this one, right? Here you say, okay, buzz you hold the camera and I'll stand over here and then in this one they say okay I'll take the camera now and you stand over here right how do you know that didn't is it a priori that didn't happen can you tell just by figuring it out that didn't happen you can't so these are informative too so if you have this kind of photograph model of how language works how could you ever get an uninformative identity. Whenever you get two signs, you can't tell from the signs themselves whether they were generated by the same object or by different objects. So Frege's problem actually gets harder at this point, not easier. And on that bombshell, <laughs> Okay, um, so see you on Wednesday, and uh, I'm sorry, but we don't have office hours this week. Okay. And if you do need to talk to me urgently, then do mail. Uh,